Uh, folks, thank you for tuning in tonight to our Mountain Zoom series. Um, we have as our guest speaker tonight, uh, Martha Yant. Uh, Martha was a longtime uh, FCS agent in the Quicksand area, which is where uh, I'm located. And uh, she was an excellent FCS agent, and I mean that very truly. Uh, I always thought of her being the, the one of the best, if not the best, uh, that we had. And uh, then she got recognized finally by the higher ups, and they snatched her up to uh, greater things. And so she is, uh, I don't know what your official title is now, Martha, you'll have to tell us what that is, but uh, uh, I'm going to just turn it over to you and, and let you share with them about freezer bag cooking, which is great for uh, outdoors people. Okay, well, thanks, Shad. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, that was an, a very nice way of him saying that I'm really old and I've been around a long time, but, the, but that's true. I really enjoyed 27 years in the Breathitt County Extension Office, got to work with some great people across the whole, um, our quicksand area and, and even broader than that. And actually I just got, you all know how the extension agents pace is. I actually just got to the point that I couldn't keep that pace up anymore and an opportunity came up with the nutrition education program. They put a new position at Quicksand, which is in Bretha County at the Robinson Center. And so I've been there for five years now. And with us tonight, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit later is Jen Robinson. Jen, I don't know if you can turn your camera on, but she's been with the nutrition education program a uh, year and a half now, is that right? Yeah, a little over a year and a half. Okay. And uh, so she'll tell you a little bit more about her, but I'm going to tell my story first because I'm living proof that you don't have to be good at something to enjoy it and or to have fun with it. And that is backpacking. So that's something I have camped, tent camped um, with my family growing up and then uh, with my current family. And I was a Girl Scout leader and really enjoyed that. And I had always wanted to do some backpacking. So I'm a wannabe, uh, but you can look at Shad and, and the others of you that are, that are really um, successful at backpacking. And, and mine sort of a, a different way. It's extremely hard for me. Um, the first time I ever went backpacking was about 15 years ago and I was 45 and hitting, getting close to that 50 mark. And I thought, well, if I'm ever gonna do this, I might as well just go ahead and do it. Because if you wait until you're in shape or you wait until to all these things, then you may never get to try it. And so I, I, I had an opportunity to go on a two night uh, backpacking training at Buckskin, the Buckskin Trail at uh, Cave Run Lake. And it was the absolute worst experience of my entire life. The gear was awful. Food was awful, it rained, it, it was just terrible. And all the way home, driving home from that, I just couldn't wait to go again. And so I have had some, I've had some better, better experiences. And even though my husband won't go with me, he certainly has helped me get some good gear. And so it's not ultralight, um, it's just entry level backpacking gear. And then so this year, for my 50th birthday, I did 50 miles on the Appalachian Trail. It took me four whole years. This year, I'm getting ready to turn 60 and my goal is 60 miles on the shelter we trace. And it won't all be overnights, but um, my husband says what I like about backpacking is really I just want to play house out in the woods. And that's true, that is what I like. So let's talk about these freezer meals. Um, I have had so much fun playing with this. Um, I started out, um, okay, well, before we start into this, let me do some disclaimers. So hike your own hike, you've heard that. And that means people's, what people want out of their backpacking experience will be different and what they want out of their food will be different. So for some people, it really, it really doesn't matter what it tastes like as long as it's easy and fast. For other people, it, it matters more and maybe the, the weight or the simplicity doesn't matter. So everybody just needs to find their own thing. So I'm gonna share some things with you tonight and they may or may not be what, what fits your plan. 
my son-in-law and some of his friends went backpacking over the Christmas holiday. And I think um, their, their meal plan's a little bit different. They carried steaks and potatoes and they drew straws to see who had to carry the cast iron skillet. So, um, so a little bit different on that plan than somebody who's doing 100 miles in a week, they probably wouldn't want to carry a cast iron skillet. So freezer bag cooking is not really cooking, it's rehydrating. And all bags are not, um, not the same. And I've got an assortment of bags to show you. So the thinnest of these might be just a, a sandwich bag. And so that's a very thin and it also melts at a very low temperature. So it would not be good for pouring hot water in. There are also snack size bags that are perfect for portioning, but again, they would not hold up well with hot water going in them. And then we, we say freezer bag um, cooking, and we're going to talk about freezer bags, but the official recommendation from a major manufacturer. So freezer bags are thicker than storage bags. But the official recommendation from the manufacturer is that you not put water in these. It's over 150 degrees because at that point, the plastic starts to melt and the seams can uh, give away. Would be you can purchase cook in bags that are really heavy duty specialty bag from uh, backpacking companies. They cost about a dollar each by the time you pay shipping on them. So this kind with the little zip top is for pouring up to boiling water in 212 degrees. And then they also have some that are uh, boil in bags, which means you put your food down in the bag, seal the top and drop it down in boiling water. Now I can tell you for a fact that Jen and I are not gonna follow you around the woods with a thermometer to see if the water you put in your freezer bag is over 150 degrees. It's just our job to be sure that you know what the manufacturer's recommendation is and so that you can make an informed decision and take that risk. Um, there's not a risk of chemicals leaching into your food at those temperatures. It'd really have to be up closer to 1500 degrees for you to get any leaching and there are no dioxins or BPA in, um, in commercial freezer bags, food bags anyway. So the risk there is that the bag will soften and burst. So if it doesn't matter to you that you, you might lose a meal or make a mess, then you can decide for yourself if, if the risk is worth it on that. All right, well, I did do a few things last night and take some pictures just so I wouldn't have to move my camera around. So I'm gonna to talk to you about groceries. So Shad, will it let me share my screen? We'll have to wait and see if you can give me permission for that. And we can make it work um, if you can't or who, whoever the host is on this. So I don't know if Phil set it up. I'll wait a minute and see. I think Shad is, there you go. Okay, thanks. All right. And you're just gonna have to see this, the sides on here. It, um, it doesn't work very well when I go the other way. Okay, so this is some commercial pictures, not my real ones. I hope that one that's in Shad's background is really his. So freezer bag cooking is really just rehydrating. And so the question is, where do you find, where do you find this stuff? So I limited my practice meals here to only things that I could find in Jackson. That's very restricted because this is what we have. We have a Dollar General, we have a Save-A-Lot, a, a very small, poorly stocked Save-A-Lot. We have a very small IGA and we have a not super Walmart. So it doesn't have a full line of um, groceries in it. We also have a gas station that carries an almost full line of groceries, but I did not go in there because they're more expensive on all those things. And I was so surprised that I found quite a few things in those stores 
that would be appropriate for making your own backpacking meals. And my disclaimer here is that the brands that are in the pictures, we're not recommending those. This is just what I could find. So in the, in the grains category, grains and starches, instant mashed potatoes, instant rice, instant grits, um, tortillas, instant oatmeal. So all of these things I was able to buy in, in my little town. And so there was a very good variety of grains and starches. When you got to the lower temperature, some of them didn't rehydrate as well as at a higher temperature. Then the vegetables were the hardest one uh, and that's understandable. So there were really very few dehydrated vegetables that I could find here. There were two soup mixes. There's a, a spring vegetable recipe mix that has some dried vegetables in it. There was actually this chili mix. And for the nutrition education recipes, we have to meet the dietary guidelines for Americans, which means the sodium level is really, really low. And with any kind of packaged food, sodium is generally the issue. There was another, um, another dried vegetable soup mix that I haven't tried yet. Instant minced onion that you can buy for a dollar at the dollar store is a great way to add some flavor without adding any sodium. And you can put in a couple of tablespoons of that and that works very well. And there's so many um, herbs, and spice mixtures that don't contain sodium. And then right in the middle there, you can see that, um, that I was able to find sodium-free chicken bouillon, which is a good way to add some flavor without adding extra sodium because a traditional bouillon cube has a lot of sodium in it. And you may not have to worry about that. Jen, our dietitian, will give us more details on, uh, so somebody that's hiking 100 miles in a week is gonna need uh, different nutritional things than I would doing my two miles a day over the weekend. Okay, so that was our vegetables. Um, found lots of fruits, both traditionally dehydrated fruits and uh, freeze-dried fruits. And then for proteins, I was um, pleased the dollar store actually had a lot of the pouches of different flavored tunas and chicken. So there's a there is a, a buffalo chicken pouch that wasn't too bad on the sodium and added some flavor to that. And of course, they're just the plain regular tunas and chicken. And then um, for other proteins, there was a powdered peanut butter that we're using in one of the recipes tonight. And then this quinoa vegetable mix, I had it in both the vegetable picture and in uh, the protein. So that's a grain, but it, it has a little more protein in it than um, some others. And then our nuts and seeds. And there was an excellent selection of nuts and trail mixes that were lower in sodium. Now, um, there were some that were quite high in sodium, but I was really pleased at, that I found several that were low enough in sodium that they met our guidelines. The pepitas are roasted pumpkin seed kernels. So that's the inside part. And then the sunflower kernels, that's just the inside part. So it takes away the fun of getting to spit the outer shell out, but uh, it's an easy way to add uh, a plant-based protein in, in your food. So I'm gonna show this little uh, video of putting the bags together. And then I'm actually gonna pour the water in and while they're reconstituting, Jen's gonna talk to us about nutrition. So this is just a few minutes long. Let me see if I can get it rolling. And if it's, um, let's see if it will go. And if not, we'll try it a different way. Martha, we had a question really quickly. Okay. The chat. I didn't know if you could see the chat box or not. Um, I can't. That's okay. From Chad, he said, how do you know what constitutes high sodium? So I can answer that or you can, either one. Why don't you go ahead and address that while I'm finding a different way to get to this um, video? Sure, so um, just in standard nutrition, when we look at sodium and different foods and, and how they're packaged, sorry you all, I'm trying to get my screen <laughs> together here. Um, but gen as a general rule of thumb, um, when you're looking at these meals, something that's considered quote unquote high sodium 
is typically anything that has 400 milligrams of sodium or more in one serving. And right when we're looking at a nutrition label, we see the serving size um, that is recommended in that container. So if it's three fourths a cup, but then there may be four servings in that container. So then we really have to look and see how do we need to, to, to multiply those numbers if I'm eating more than one serving and if I'm getting more sodium than that's on that nutrition label because those facts that you see are, are for one serving in that package. Um, and then also, as Martha mentioned, a lot of those prepackaged foods when we were going through this project, and of course, when in our jobs with the nutrition education program here in Kentucky with the extension office, um, we, we do err on the side of lower sodium options for our participants um, that come through our program. And so we try to implement that as well and, and think of that when we were doing and creating these recipes. And Martha did a great job going and checking her resources um, it, they're in Eastern Kentucky because I live in Lexington. So as you all know, very easy. I could go, you know, and hit up about five different grocery stores in you know, two mile radius around me and easily get whatever. And I can go to, you know, a store and easily get a mountain house or a backpacker pantry already prepared meal. Um, but in those you do, you have that high sodium content and we'll talk about it in a, in a second, but Martha, uh, did, allude to it in that um, whenever you are on the trail and you are hiking and also it it really does matter um, and needs to take into consideration how many miles in a day you're doing, how strenuous is the hike. Um, sometimes that having that quote unquote higher sodium can be good because you're depleting a lot of those sources, but we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, I think, I, I think I've got where we can see this. Okay, and I, I there's no sound to it. So I'm just going to talk as it goes this way. I just didn't have to move my camera. So Jen, can you can you see that now? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is the PBNJ breakfast, and I'm using three packages of plain instant oatmeal. Uh, the, that's the one that doesn't have anything added to it. So there's no sugar um, or there's no flavorings to it. And, we, and I will address why you'd want to. And then we're adding three tablespoons of instant non-fat milk powder. So that's our powdered milk, two tablespoons of powdered sugar to put a little sweetness in there, two tablespoons of powdered peanut butter. And that was one of the protein products that I found. And then last is a fourth a cup of dried fruit. And these are freeze dried strawberries. Now I made it the, the first trial with just some traditionally dried strawberries and, and that worked really well. With the freeze dried one, I actually would like a little more strawberry in there uh, to give it a stronger flavor. And that would not add very many calories or much sugar or anything. And then that makes enough for two servings. And so I'm gonna divide it out into two bags. And so that first one, that's that, um, that one that is designed for boiling water. It is definitely a heavier plastic bag. And then that one is just my regular freezer bag. And I like to scoop it out and try to get the same number of strawberries in each serving so that somebody doesn't get cheated on that. And I'm just eyeing it but you could use a scale um, to make sure that you were getting, getting it evenly divided if you wanted to, if that mattered. But it worked out pretty well, just, um, just eyeing it to see that I've got about half in each bag. And then seal, seal that up tight. And then that way I've got two servings ready to go. Now those heavy duty bags, they do say that you can wash them out and use them a couple of times, but really the main point of the freezer bag cooking is not to have to deal with any, um, any dirty dishes, I think. All right, and then um, we're gonna go ahead and let, uh, let this run about the spring veggie couscous and chicken. And you may not be familiar with couscous, but a lot of backpackers really count on that because it is just to pour hot water in and it's cooked. And couscous is actually a pasta, it's a very small pasta. 
And then I'm putting in a tablespoon of that spring vegetable soup mix that has the vegetables. And then that is a tablespoon of instant minced onion going in and a fourth a teaspoon of garlic powder. And so that goes in, in the bag. And um, when you get ready to, to eat it, you prepare the couscous and then you stir in a pouch of chicken when it's done. Okay, so I'm gonna turn that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I have those here. I have the, um, the peanut butter and jelly breakfast and it says to add a half a cup of hot water. So I'm gonna do that right here. Now I'm cheating tonight, Chad, I'm using, I'm using my electric kettle. I do, have, I do have other ways to heat the water. Whoops, I went up to three fourths cup. Let's pour some of that back in. And I do know that some people actually like to cold soak. So I checked with Sandra Bass and she is one of the specialists at UK. Well, she's moved up now, but she is the food safety guru and freezer bag cooking that we're doing is not a, a food safety issue at all because it fits within the time and temperature guidelines. So you don't have to worry about this food not being safe because it doesn't sit out long enough for any bacteria to grow. All right. So I have put my hot water in and sort of swished that around. I'm going to put it in this little Reflectix pouch. And yes, I made that myself. And you, I don't know if you can see the uh, lovely decorative duct tape on it, but you might as well make things pretty. And then let's go ahead and reconstitute because I'm gonna put them both down in the pouch, the, the couscous. And it also takes a half a cup of hot water. So cold soaking, that's where I was going. There are some food safety issues with cold soaking, not for grains, um, that's not a problem at all. But if there are meats or dairy in your recipe and you're wanting to cold soak, then you are taking a risk there with some uh, foodborne illness pathogens having time to grow. And foodborne illness is, is it's not pleasant anytime, but if you just have sort of an upset stomach and, um, and maybe some diarrhea at home, it's, a, it's not an issue. But if you're on the trail, it might be a bigger issue. So I, I would recommend that you think carefully when you're making your decisions about cold soaking, if you're considering doing cold soaking with some meats. Okay, so this little pouch is just made out of Reflectix. And I bought it in a, in a roll for another project. You'd find it where the window, uh, like window film and things are. And um, I made a pouch put together with duct tape. It's just big enough to hold those pouches. So while we're waiting the 10 minutes it's gonna take for those, we're gonna let Jen talk to us from a nutritionist point of view. And this is a great opportunity I'm looking, I can see the chat box now. Nanette, yes, the, these recipes are in handout. So I'm gonna mute and let Jen have her turn. Thank you. Um, I see we have another question. How long could these be placed in storage? I'm thinking a little off topic using it for emergency prep foods. Good idea. So Martha, do you have, um, have an idea of how long that these could be stored in a cool dry place? Let's Let's come back to that, Jeremy, if, if okay. you don't mind. And so Jen, go ahead and we'll come sure. back to that. Sure, so, and I also wanna mention that um, Martha, we have Patrick Allen on here as well. He's been working on this project with us also. And so I know he was testing these recipes tonight and um, I tested them last night. And so um, we it's been a fun adventure. So a little bit about me, uh, Martha, Martha gave me an introduction. But I'm Jen Robinson. I, uh, I work with the Nutrition Education Program in Martha, and I am um, an air, what we call an area agent. So I have assistants that are scattered throughout central Kentucky nutrition education assistants. And, um, and so we have a lot of fun getting to work together and getting to work with people um, that have limited resources. And so when Martha asked me to join this project, uh, it, it piqued my interest very much so because I'm very passionate about nutrition, being a dietitian and going to school for that. 
But then also um, I love hiking and backpacking so much. And I'm always constantly trying to figure out uh, the most nutritious meals that I can take on the trail without spending a ton of money. And also what's going to fill me up. And, you know, that end of the day, that long hike that I'm on, that food that's going to just be satisfying before I go lay down in my tent to go to sleep and get ready for the next day. So um, just to give you all a heads up, whenever talking about backpacking nutrition and just nutrition in general, you hear the term macronutrients a lot. And it's macronutrients are super important, not only when you're backpacking and, but also in, you know, just general health and in your diet, um, everyday diet. But whenever you're thinking in terms of backpacking and hiking and camping, as I had said, mentioned before, you're depleting those sources down. You know, you're depleting down the electrolytes that are in your body. You're burning all those carbohydrates up. And so you need to restore that energy. So our macronutrients are our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our fats. And so we kind of thought about that when we were coming up and like brainstorming for this project and, and writing our notes. And I had mentioned that to, to Martha and Patrick as well when we were when we were going through this is we really need to think about like those that we can, those meals that can be well-rounded. And then we're like, oh, well, for doing them in a freezer bag, you know, you're obviously limited to what you can do, but thought outside of the box and Martha came up with these great recipes. Um, so thinking about that, whenever you're hiking, and as, as I said, it's a lot of it has to do with the number of miles that you're doing in a day. So if you're sitting down and doing a couple of miles you know, in a day, maybe three or four, and, you know, you wouldn't necessarily need to go and get 6,000 calories in at the end of the day, because you've burned so many calories, right? And so think about that whenever you're preparing these meals and thinking, oh, well, what nutrients might I need whenever I'm out on the trail? A good rule of thumb that I always try to follow whenever I'm out hiking is to always have some sort of electrolyte, Right. So that with that being because you're going to be sweating, you're going to whether it's hot or cold outside, you're going to be depleting those electrolytes. So that's your sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So as Martha said, we're not trying to plug any brands or stores, um, but I personally do use try to typically get like those. You can get some of the chews. The Gatorade brand is great. Again, not trying to plug them, but um, I've, I've found good success with those but then also getting an electrolyte drink um, that you could keep in your backpack, some of those smaller mini bottles that you could keep in there um, and take with you. And that's gonna be crucial um, to replace that sodium and everything that's coming out as you're sweating. Um, and I know that a lot of the, the clothing that is geared, especially now, gosh, there's so many different things that, that you can buy and cool gadgets and clothes and camping gear. Um, but a lot of those clothes are very, um, uh, moisture wicking and they're like the you know the dry fit type clothing um, to where they'll dry really quickly as soon as they absorb that sweat it's going to dry out and so maybe you won't realize that you're sweating as much and potentially getting dehydrated so not only are the electrolytes important in replenishing those but also staying hydrated so important I would recommend to all of you all if you don't have a good hydration pack you know those big bladders that you can buy those they're thick and plastic. You can get them, you know, as I, I'm not certain the smallest size you can get, I would say half a liter or a liter all the way up to, you know, ones that can fit in your pack that are hold four and five liters of water. So invest in that as well, because you need to be replenishing that fluid while you're hiking. I think for me personally, that's one of the easiest things that I can, you can just be on the trail and you're so excited about your hike and your destination where you're going. You're like, oh man, I haven't drank hardly any water and I have my pack and it's full. And so not only that, you know, when you drink that water, you're letting a little bit of weight out of your pack too. So it's a little bit easier of a hike. So I also wanted to mention that of thinking about pack weight whenever you're hiking and thinking about nutrition and the foods you're taking. Um, I've done some good backcountry trips out West, um, out in Yellowstone, out in Utah, uh, Utah is probably my favorite place to hike. And even here in the gorge have done a lot of backpacking and it's all about the weight of your pack. 
and can you, how light can you get it? And you get some people that want to do ultra light. Maybe some of you all have, um, but I know when I first started, I did a, por a portion of a trail up in New Hampshire. It's actually a portion of that um, Appalachian trail. It's called the Presidential Traverse. Y'all, that was like some of the worst weather. I feel like I experienced every season there was while I was on that 23 miles of trail. But I had packed too much food, too many clothes. It was just, it was a miserable trip. So I think that's something else to keep in mind whenever you're packing these meals and, you know, having these four freezer bag meals that you can, you know, use water reconstitute at the end of your day. Um, they're lightweight, they pack really easy, they don't take up a lot of room, and they're nutritious for you. We actually ran the nutrition analysis on them, um, and when Martha sends them to you all, you all will be able to see that. So it, so nutrition analysis, you'll have a nutrition facts label, so you'll be able to see the breakdown of the nutrients that are in there, um, those, you know, the carbohydrates, the fats, the protein that's in there, all of that sodium or sodium level, as well as um, your sugar levels that are in there. So you'll really be able to see how they're going to break down and benefit um, you as you're on the trail. So, and I also want to also want to say, Martha, that um, last night, whenever I was trying these meals out, so Martha showed you all, she has that awesome pouch. Patrick and I were actually talking about um, an insulated pouch like that. And I got to thinking to myself, I was like, what would I have whenever I'm out on the trail that maybe I could stick this bag in to kind of capture some of that heat that'll be coming out and sort of indirectly cook, you know, retain some of that heat and cook. So I actually um, have a, a, one of the bigger Yeti like Rambler insulated uh, water bottles. And so I stuck one of the bags down in that to see if it would actually speed up the process. Um, and then I put another bag, a couple of the bags just in an insulated lunchbox that I had um, that's here at my house. And then also in another smaller Yeti cup. And I was like, I just want to see. And of course, it can be any insulated cup or any insulated pouch, um, but just something like that. But it really did. It did speed up the process. And I was impressed with how warm the food was, because when you're at the end of a hike, you're just like, oh, that's what I want. I just want that food. I, it's been grueling. I've done 15 miles today. Y'all probably think I'm crazy, but I'm just like, I've done 15 miles today and I just want that chili Mac tonight. Like that is what I have looked forward to all day. And you don't want it to be ruined and end up on the ground. So I think that Martha has a good thing going with these freezer bags. And if you all have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask or type in the chat box or Patrick, if you would like to join in with your experience of, he, I mean, Martha, he just tested these out. So he might have some, some good things to say. So if you don't know, uh, Patrick Allen is the 4-H agent in Scott County. So if, if you don't mind, Patrick, if you don't mind turning your camera on and, and tell a little bit of your story. Um, so yeah, I just tried them. Um, they, they all went pretty well. I did kind of like what Jen uh, did. I have a, a Yeti um, one gallon water jug. Uh, it's insulated, so I used that. And I just did all of them at once and then, and then put them all in, the, in the, uh, the jug and put on the lid and let, one of them uh, requires a little bit longer to sit than the others. So I just pulled them out at the right time and uh, it worked out. I used, um, to heat the water, I, just, to, just to test it, I used um, a, um, my jet boil here at the house because I wanted to make sure that I could try to monitor the temperature as we went um, just because of the bags. Um, and so it worked out pretty well. And I, the way that I kind of gauged the temperature for the, for the jet boil is if you have a jet boil, there, some, some of them have a window where it will um, show you a color change and so as it started to just barely change color, um, I uh, tried that out, took the temperature and it was about the, the 150 uh, mark uh, area. So it worked out pretty good. And I, I thought maybe that would be a good judgment as opposed to having a thermometer on trail just to try to figure out where it might hit on that color change. So, but yeah, they all worked out really good. And Patrick has been teaching some, he does some outdoor survival 
outdoor cooking trainings. He just had one not long ago, but um, they have been they've been very gracious on on the food things because when we're meeting those nutrition guidelines and it has to be a side dish has to be under 200 milligrams of sodium and a combination dish has to be under 700 milligrams of sodium that's that's really really low but the good news is if you don't have to worry about your sodium now one third of kentuckians like me has high blood pressure and so it's good that you know any recipe from the nutrition education program meets those dietary guidelines. And then if you don't have to worry about yours, then you can add a little more salt to it and know that you're still, still not overdoing it. But if you, if you look on the packages of, I'm gonna say it, my very favorite is the Idahoan loaded baked potato, instant mashed potatoes. And if you eat that whole pouch, it's like 1,400 milligrams of sodium. So, so okay, I think we're, our time is about it. And I know um, there were several things that my husband wouldn't even taste when I was practicing on things. And I threw, I did throw a lot of things out. I made myself take three bites of everything because the first bite, sometimes it's a little shock if it's really bad. So you got to do those other two and see how they turn out. Uh, but the, the recipes that are in the publication that we can share with you in the fact sheet were the ones that got a passing grade. Now, of course, they, um, you can tell that they're not, um, they're not loaded with salt and sugar like so many of the foods that we eat and are accustomed to are. All right, so here is our, our breakfast oatmeal. You see, you can't really see, but it has, it has thickened up. And then our couscous, which is really the backpacker's friend. That's that tiny little pasta that really just takes hot water on it to reconstitute. And I did notice with this vegetable soup mix that the celery in there doesn't rehydrate quite, quite as well. So I don't know if, if you noticed that, Jen. I, I didn't really like that. I didn't like that it was still hard. And we're going to- Martha that um, when I was testing those last night I actually kept and put in containers the um, couscous and the chili rice to eat later because I was like those are great I mean I would easily take those out on uh, on the trail with me and have just because they were so easy and spices there are so many spices that you can use to add flavor now the, the chili I just guessed on the chili powder on that recipe, the fourth a teaspoon, because I don't like it spicy. And so I made mine with less. Um, if you like the, those red chili flakes, there's no sodium in that. Just add that to it as much as you want. But so many of our popular things like maybe a, a Cajun spice blend that has lots and lots of sodium and um, red sauce, hot hot sauce, that's got a lot of sodium too. But you, you fit your needs. So if you need to watch the sodium, we're trying to help you be able to do that. And if you don't, then it's really easy to add a little bit more of that. So you, you can't really see this and I'll try to not drop it on my computer keyboard, but this has, has fluffed up and it's completely done. So the couscous recipes I really like because they're so easy to do and they turn out so well. So the chili, the chili rice, that was the only kind of dried beans that I could find here in, uh, in Jackson. But like Jen said, if you live somewhere else, then uh, you have access to so many more things. So why would we be interested in, in making our own meals like this? Mainly for two reasons. And one is the, the nutrition part and another is the cost savings. So th this, this meal, including the bag that cost a dollar, cost $3.30. And most of the Mountain House or other backpacking ones would be 12 or $13 for that one meal. And just so I would have some kind of uh, something to compare against, I got this West Memphis grits, which was fabulous. It tasted fabulous. It was a half a cup serving and it cost nine dollars. So to me, the cost of the purchased ones 
is just out of out of what I would. Uh, now, in some situations, you know, that it's going to be worth that cost because you have the security of knowing what it is and knowing uh, that it's going to hold up and, and all those things. But really, that is that's a lot of money. If you're looking at spending twenty five to thirty dollars per day, and that's not counting snacks, that would just be uh, three meals a day. That can really add up if you're trying to get several days in. It they do taste fabulous, I have to say that, but I don't know that nine dollars for half a cup of um, grits that I could just justify that. So some questions, other things, was how long? How long do they last? So when you buy dehydrated things from the store, <clears throat> um, like, like beef jerky, now we, we didn't put jerky in these, but that is a really easy thing to buy and use. It, it does have a lot of salt in it, so you just balance out what fits for you. But once you open this commercial package of a dehydrated food, then that means it's not necessarily still shelf stable because here in Kentucky, it is quite humid. And so as soon as we open this package, we're letting, we're letting air in and we're letting humidity in. And moisture is what makes the pathogen start to grow in most of the time. Now some, some grow without moisture, but most of the time it, it is moisture getting into these products that then makes them maybe not shelf stable. If you wanted to make some of these ahead of time, just for convenience, using things that you had to open the package, you could probably keep them in the freezer for some time, but it might be easiest to not add those things until you're ready. So bacon pieces, one of the recipes that's in the handout is a loaded mashed potato. It's, it's a close, uh, it's a close substitute for that Idaho and one that I really, really like, but it has a lot less sodium. And I did use some real bacon pieces. So that package is shelf stable for a long time until I open it. And once I open it and moisture can start getting in that, that means it might not last as long. But if you keep those commercial packages sealed, so Jeremy, if you were thinking of emergency prep foods, then um, just don't open those the commercially dried packages until you're ready to start putting that together. And Shad says if you vacuum pack them, that can really help on, um, you know, I'm going to ask Sandra Baston that question um, to see once you put a commercially packaged, that's an excellent question, Shad. I, I'm going to have to follow up with that and then I'll try to get that information back out. Um, at least to you three, so you can share that with the people, but good question. Okay, so um, water treatment, we gotta talk about that. If you are boiling your water to treat it, you need to let it boil for one full minute, full rolling boil, and then let it cool a little bit before you put it in, in your bag so that you can cut down that risk of them melting. I know some people choose not to, but again, not to treat their water. But again, that um, we want to give you an informed, so you can make an informed decision on that. And um, in the, it's a four a front and back two page handout, and there is some information there about treating water, because there can be pathogens in there that you can't see, smell, taste that can really make you sick. And so the official recommendation is that you do treat your any water that you get from out in the wild. And you can do that. Boiling is actually one of the one of the most successful ways to do that. It needs to come to a full rolling boil for one full minute. And if you're over at certain elevations, it need to be a little bit longer, but you have to have fuel for that. So then there is, um, there's that extra weight of the fuel. You can use a filter that gets lots of things out, not quite everything. And then there are tablets. And I think the official recommendation is that if you use the filter and the tablets, then you get a very good, um, you can be very secure about the water, about you getting everything out of that. Okay, money. Yes, money is, is the big thing on those. And so even though the dollar a bag, when I first ordered these, I thought, my goodness, I would never do that. And then once I got them and saw that they were noticeably thicker and a very sturdy bag, then for part of your trip, they might be worth that extra purchase. 
this regular, um, so this bag costs a dollar and this bag costs seven cents. So it's, it is a big difference, but there might be some of your meals that you're going to reconstitute that, that it would be worth that extra money just for that extra security on that. And there are reusable zip top bags made out of silicone that can handle all kinds of temperatures, uh, but you have to wash those. And so if the whole goal is to cut down on your, your time and clean up, uh, then that might not meet your needs. All right, I think well, we're, getting, we're getting up close to our time and I think we covered, I'm gonna have to find out about the vacuum sealing, um, if, how, that, how much that extends the time. Dried foods, if you home dry foods, um, you can store them in the freezer, which keeps them from rehydrating and so they last longer. And um, I don't think there were any, any other questions on that. And Nanette had sent me a question and I, I replied to her and Nanette, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and we'll talk more. That was exceptionally good. Uh, there have been a number of compliments uh, stated behind the scenes uh, while you guys were talking. So thank hey, Chad, you. Can I ask Martha a question real fast? Yes, yes. Martha, did you say that you bought all of that stuff at the, at the dollar store in Jackson? I bought all of it in Jackson, uh, but I went to the dollar store and IGA and Save-A-Lot and Walmart. So I, I really had fun. I just went and walked up and down all the aisles and looked to see what they had that met our um, like instant potatoes that are just plain. They have zero sodium in them. So if you start out with that, you can add whatever you want to and customize it. I, I found powdered buttermilk, which does have some sodium, but it gives it that sour cream taste. And so the loaded mashed potato recipe that is in the, in the handout has the powdered buttermilk, which I can find here in Jackson at Walmart and it's not, it's not that expensive and it'll go a long way. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised at the dollar store um, and ours is just a little one, just a dollar general that they had quite a few things that were less expensive. Thank you. One last thing is that Patrick and Jen and I, plus Joey Barnard with 4-H Camping, we have um, another handout on Dutch oven cooking. I know that Patrick does a lot of that. And we're going to do one more that is called Front Country Camping. Uh, for people more aimed at family camping, people that are going to established campgrounds. And so then we will have those resources. And I also sent Jeremy, Shad, and Phil links to a really good foodsafety.gov publication on, has a lot more information on food safety when you're hiking, camping, and boating. And if you're interested in dehydrating your own food, check with your uh, FCS agents and they will get you the um, the information on home food dehydrating. And I'm gonna look into drying some vegetables since I really couldn't find, couldn't find those in the store. I've got one I want you to work on. <clears throat> okay. Backpacker Pantry had one that was called Salmon Pesto. And it came with a little filet and obviously the pesto and a little pouch of olive oil. It was the bomb, the best meal in the world. My favorite backpacking meal of all time. And for whatever reason, they said that their supplier of their salmon um, was, uh, they couldn't find somebody that could meet their standards. And so they discontinued that until they could find someone else. So if there's some way you could come up with a, uh, a, a salmon pesto, and if Jen's familiar with the meal, then she could tell you uh, kind of <laughs> what it was like, but it was, it was great. <laughs> yeah, I have to, I'll have to look. And if yeah. you look in your, you go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I'd had that one time and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is the best, best meal that I have had on, probably on the trail was that one. And I can remember I was eating it out West. I was like, this is great. I'm never leaving this spot. This is so good. <laughs>
We can't find those dried, the dried salmon here in Jackson, but international grocery stores are a really good place to find a, a variety of dried things. And if you look in the Hispanic food section, you can find the full fat powdered milk. So if you're not needing to limit those fat calories, if you're really burning off, then it would be better to substitute the full fat powdered milk instead of the non-fat dry that we typically recommend. And the Asian, Asian markets really have some interesting, strange and interesting dehydrated uh, mushrooms and fish. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a lot of options out there if you, if you can travel a little farther. There are other brands that uh, we've stumbled upon recently that uh, have some of those like shiitake uh, type uh, pouches but they're very expensive. You talked about the price. Some of those are 15 and $18. And it's just, you know, I'm going backpacking because that's a cheap uh, thing to do. And when you start paying that kind of money, it's not cheap anymore. Are there any other questions for uh, Martha or Jen or Patrick? We want to be uh, uh, put on the list for samplers. So when you guys do these things, uh, we would like to be uh, maybe a, a, a survey group or a uh, uh, guinea pigs. Okay, but I have to tell you, some are better than others. <laughs> well, that's the way the, the store-bought ones are as well. <laughs> We'll take the uh, second step samplers then. Uh, Y'all do the first step and then let us know. Let us know the good ones. We'll do the second step. <laughs> I, I had a Santa Fe chicken uh, one time that was given to me and I couldn't eat it. And so I, I ruck it out by a tree. And one of the guys that was with me said, is there a bear problem here? And I said, oh no. And this was the year of that Easter freeze, if you remember uh, that. And a black bear came right into our camp to get to that Santa Fe chicken the next morning. So I, I felt sorry for the bear, to be honest. Uh, after he ate that, I, I think he was living hard. So um, <laughs> yeah, some of those can be too spicy, but we, we thank you all very much. Jaquita has a question here. Uh, where did you find? Okay. Yeah. Walmart. Now that one, I actually had to, uh, my Walmart was out of those. Um, and the, you might have noticed that the brand name on some of my dehydrated fruit was the Aldi brand, but I can get that in Jackson. They were just out of it. So I went ahead and bought that. But um, the powdered peanut butter comes in several different brands and you can find that at um, Kroger, Walmart. Um, my, I did not see it at um save a lot or the dollar store. Nanette, I can't understand what she's saying. You sounded like a robot, Nanette. You can put it in the chat box. Okay, Nanette says that Food City in Whitesburg carries it. So that's good to know. So when you're in your regular stores, just spend a little time walking up and down the rows and um, look and, and see what you can find. I was very pleasantly surprised that I was able to, to find as many things here as, as I did. I was gonna point out one other thing, Martha, and that is that the store-bought ones that you buy, uh, you're kind of limited on the options and this opens up the possibility for a lot of different uh, things that I can't tell you how many times I've eaten the lasagna or the spaghetti. And, uh, you know, after, if you're on a, a five to eight day trip, there's only so many times you can eat that before it kind of loses its appeal. So the variety of this is, is a great thing. And I want to add to that, just the ability to be able to control what goes into your meal and you know, if you want more carbohydrates or if you need more protein and, you know, you, you're able to add that in and also be able to control that sodium. So, you know, if you're drinking all of that water, like my dog is doing right now, I don't know if you all can hear her or not, 
Um, but if you're drinking all of that water and then packing in the sodium at the end of the day, you're going to have that bloat feeling like you're, you know, that puffy feeling because your, your body is going to retain that. So just to, I think these two just give you that variety, but also give you the, um, the control over your nutrition and what you're putting in your body. Very good. Okay. Well, I think uh, unless anybody has a question, one last offer. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. That was uh, an incredibly good and exceptionally good uh, presentation. So uh, this will go out on YouTube and on our Facebook pages. And um, I'm sure it will be picked up by some of our trail. The Pine Mountain Trail will probably share it. And uh, so you'll be famous. Uh, <laughs> but thank you all very much uh, for doing this. Chad, are you all able to share the uh, those resource links? I'm, I don't have them to put in the chat box, but if you all could share them with your with your people, that would be great. Well, let me see. And and I can dig around here and see if I can find them. I tell you what, if people will put their uh, name in the chat box. Uh, we can uh, email uh, those to you, um, and that might be the easiest way to do it. Bill's dropping them in there right now, it looks like. He's got the, uh, the food safety while hiking, uh, camping, and boating in there. Thank you, Phil. Yes, thank you. Great. Yeah, so, a good agent, Martha. So has the other pub, the FCS 350, or uh, 3501, I guess. That one's the dehydrating foods. And then there should be one on jerky. And so I think that's that next one. 3594. And I'm going to put my, my email in, in the box. So those um, publications with the recipes, if you just email me, I'll be glad to, to send those to you. And that might be the, that might be the easiest, easiest thing. Oh, I guess I have to click enter for it to go. <laughs> well, this has been, Shad, thank you all for getting us involved in this project. And, and I'm so glad that Jen and Patrick wanted to be part of it. It has been a lot of fun working on it. And so we're, we're gonna keep on and adding some more recipes to, to this one with the freezer bag when, when we can spread out and get some ingredients from uh, a little farther away. Well, thank you. Come from the uh, the pub from Utah. I looked in that the the problem that oh it's got some great things in it and they look really good. It was getting the getting them to meet our nutrition guidelines that is challenging. Okay, very good. Well, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all okay. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, we appreciate it. Uh, Jeremy, do you want to share what we've got coming up next week? Yeah, uh, next week on Tuesday, we have pasture renovation. And on Thursday, we have wood ID. Very good. Well, we hope to see you all then. And until uh, next week, uh, stay safe and stay warm. Thank you for tuning in. Everybody have a good evening. You too. <laughs>